Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, hi, hello, welcome. I'm Sherilyn and I'm so glad you found me. If you're not new here, welcome back to our True Crime Wine Wednesday. I love and I appreciate you guys so, so much for being here every week with me. You mean the freaking world to me. I feel like I haven't said it in a while in an intro, so in case you forgot, which I hope you didn't, I love you. How are we, how are we feeling about this new sign, you guys? I mean, I'm no Tim the Tool Man Taylor, so my measurements were completely off. I, I really wanted like one in the corner that was gonna be like here, so you could read it all, and then I could still have some action going on this side, but um, it came humongous. And now my big old head is covering up half of it, but you guys get the point. True crime, fab wine, I don't know. I love it though. I hope you guys love it. Before we get into the video, I just wanna let you guys know that I will not be seeing you next week. I'm going to take next week to prepare for the month that I'm going to be, I guess, taking off and enjoying with the new baby and my family once she's born. But I still want to have some content out there for you, so I'm going to do as much prep as I can. I think right now what I'm thinking is for the month of April, when she's supposed to be born, instead of a new video on Wednesday, we're going to have like, I'm going to call them quick sip Saturdays. So I'm putting together all the cases that I'm really interested in, but aren't as well known and there isn't as much information out there like I like to get, but I still kind of want to share with you guys. So they won't be as long and in depth, but hopefully it'll just be something that holds you guys over while I'm taking the month off and that I can still be giving you guys some content while I'm behind the scenes doing the whole mom thing. So next week I'm gonna prepare for that. I'm going to miss you so much. You guys know this. It's so hard for me to take any time off. I mean, technically I'm still gonna be working lots behind the scenes, but like, you know, interacting with you guys and being there with you guys, I look so forward to Wednesdays. Just know you'll be missed next Wednesday. All right, today I'm so excited to be doing a collaboration with this video. It's for a new podcast that's coming out called The Opportunist. So I just wanna thank you so much to Cast Media for reaching out to me and including me. I'm really excited to share this story with you guys. It's something I didn't know and I'm even more excited to hear the podcast and how in-depth they're gonna go. I know you guys are gonna love it and be like so hooked when you hear this. So thank you guys at Cast Media for reaching out to me. But yeah, this case is just, wow. But it's really important because it involves an online cult. And I think that's so important right now because it's something that we are seeing more and more and it just it snowballs so fast and it takes on a life of its own and so I hope you know by talking about stories like this it helps bring awareness to people so you kind of know what to look for or if you see signs in somebody in your family or close like network of friends you know you're kind of prepared because you're like mm, this sounds a little bit similar to this case or this cult or this online following. Because in my personal experience, I've actually seen close friends get involved in these online followings and completely change them. So personally for me, there's an importance to do my part to spread the message and share these stories in hopes that anybody watching, you know, it could either deter them from getting involved or try your best to help a loved one come out of the fog. That's what I call it. They think they're seeing like the light, but it's like deep, heavy fog. So today we are talking about the story of Sherry Schreiner and her cult following. And I just wanna share this gift that Cast Media sent to me. We'll get more into the actual gift that they sent. It'll make more sense as we go on. So they sent me this beautiful little gold box. It had amazing wrapping paper. I appreciate, you know, like <laughs> good attention to detail and like wrapping paper. Anyways, my little one got to it before I could have a chance to like actually unwrap it with you guys. So here we are. So in Inside, they sent me this. It'll all come together. Along with this note that says, carry this organ with you to protect yourself from reptilian clones, chemtrails, and evil energies. Keep fighting, warriors. Yeah, bless. That's what we're dealing with today in this story. So this is something that Sherry Schreiner used to sell to her followers to protect them from reptilian clones, chemtrails, all that stuff. All right, so let's get into it, get into the history of the woman behind the cult, 
Sherry Schreiner, and how the obsession with her and her teachings and followings led to murder. Sherry was born in Cleveland, Ohio on December 11th, 1965. She was born into a very God-fearing house. She said there's never a time in her life where God was not a part of it. And she looked at God as her one true love. She went to Sunday school every single week. She said by the time she was 12 years old, she had read the Bible front to back. She says she followed and trusted her faith, but there was something that was missing. She was kind of, you know, like rebellious and a nonconformist as she would explain herself. And so she was seen a little bit as the black sheep of the family because she wasn't like traditionally following their religion. Her focus on the Bible became more on like the second coming of Christ and she felt like she was called to be one of the warriors that was going to be on like the front lines of this fight and when all of that went down. And since she felt this was like her calling and her gift and that's why she was placed in the world, she also felt like Lucifer knew who she was. Like the second she popped her little hat out of the womb, she was targeted. She said because of this target, she suffered from horrendous night terrors and she would always like see and feel really dark shadows and presence. She could never really like tell what it is, but she always felt like that darkness lurking trying to get at her. She said particularly at night when she'd lay in her room, she would see like dark shadows and she would just lay there and close her eyes and wish for them to go away. I mean, I feel like that was a really big focus on when she did this little autobiography of herself on her website. But I don't know if she ever, you know, like talked to other people to know that that's extremely um, common as a child. I mean, there's still days that I like scare the crap out of myself if I've got, you know, like a coat hanging over my rack and it looks like a dude standing in the corner. Like we, we all see objects at night, but for Sherry, her interpretation of seeing things at nighttime was Lucifer sending like his head henchmen to watch over her and you know like have this darkness looming over her. She said she knew that Lucifer was aware that she was going to grow up to become a prophet and spread the message of God and her beliefs and therefore that's why she was being terrorized to try to break her down at like a really young age and prevent that from ever manifesting. She actually calls herself Lucifer's arch nemesis. Gotta take her out, can't stand her, top of the hit list. She went to Liberty Baptist University in Lynchburg, Virginia, and she studied to become a radio broadcaster. And while she was in university, she had her own show within the school. And it seems like it was something that she was quite successful at because within a year of her being in school she actually became the director of like that department. While she was in school she also got her job with a newspaper in Lynchburg and the article she would write there they focus more on political news and by the time she graduated in 1991 she graduated with a degree in journalism, political science, and criminal justice. Her goal after graduation was to get a job at CNN and she applied for the job. She didn't end up getting it though. In her view, that was one of those meant to be scenarios. Her job was, you know, like on the front lines of the second coming. So maybe that's what this whole thing was. So she decides to move back to Ohio. She gets married and she starts a family very quickly and becomes like a home homemaker and a mother. She says that during the time she was in school and she was super focused on studying and working hard and all of these work projects and working for a newspaper, she had almost forgotten or didn't notice this negative energy and these evil entities that had surrounded her her whole entire life. But when she moves back to Ohio, all of a sudden, she starts to notice them again. She believes that they've returned into her life. Actually, not that they've returned, her term for it was that they were stalking her. As an outsider looking in and reading that, I kind of almost felt like it could have even been a little bit of like postpartum depression. You know, you're alone, you're isolated, you're a new mom, and you have all the time in the world to just sit there 
and think. So if some of those thoughts start to get negative, I mean, that can take a whole life of its own. And I think that that's probably how this started with Sherry. And it did definitely take on a life of its own. What she does is she just launches into overdrive and takes all the skills that she's learned um, from school of being like a journalist and a researcher. And she pours that into researching like demons, Satan, human warfare, end of times. And she would call on who she referred to as Yahweh. The meaning of the name Yahweh, he who makes that which has been made or he brings into existence, existence, whatever exists. Let's read that one again because I messed up and it's already complicated enough. He brings into existence whatever exists. There we go. Yahweh was the national God of the kingdoms of Israel. So this is who uh, Sherry refers to in her teachings. So when she's gathered all of her you know, information along this journey of hers that she's been spending so much time researching and learning about all of these different conspiracies and in her fight against evil. She creates about 15 different websites. She wrote numerous books. She started a Facebook page. She had a podcast. She had a YouTube channel. I mean, she really got her degrees worth for all of this writing and research and everything she did. But it was, you know, just pouring into this project of sharing this message that she had. Her visions and teachings, they were coming from Yahweh, she said. She said that he would share them with her. He would use her as a prophet and he would share with her future events that were going to unfold so that she could share them with her following. I mean, even just Googling her name and hearing a podcast or reading some of her writings out there, it's a, it's a cluster. It's a cluster fact, to say the least. She's a mix of like hardcore conspiracy theorist, end of days, aliens, dashed with some Christianity. One video I came across on YouTube that she's got is um, how to kill zombies. If you want to know, by the way, it's to um, purchase this. Yeah. You purchase the organ that she made because she's the one who knows how to make it properly. And you place it in some water and just kind of let it, you know, s soak into the water so the water can pull out, I, I guess it's energy. And then you take the water and I you put it in some form of blaster. I'm assuming it's like a, a water gun. <sighs> yeah. And then you cut off you cut off the zombie's head and then you you blast the cut off head part and that kills the zombies. Yeah, I actually feel terrible reacting this way and like giggling because when you read through her comment section, I mean, you see the desperation of these people in there and how seriously they take this and how much they believe her. And they're like desperate to get their hands on it and how to use it properly. And what if this situation happens? Like, will it still work if I use this type of water? Does it need to be this? Do I, can I make this organ myself, you know? Like, like, does it have to be yours? They're really, really freaking out, man. And it's just wild because from somebody who just like goes to the page and reads it, who's not in the following, who has a different opinion and perspective of what she was trying to teach, it sounds outrageous to me. So I try to like put myself in the situation of these followers of hers and you just want to reach out to them and be like, you you little nugget, like it's going to be okay. You don't need to be this scared. Believe me, there's plenty of other things in the world to be scared of than getting your hands on some organs so that you can blast them with a water gun. So when I look at it like as an outsider standpoint, I try to figure out, you know, like, hey, like what's the point? This to me was her bread and butter. She shared so many times why you needed to buy hers. She knew how to make it properly. If you saw somebody else who made it, it was just sent, you know, from the evil doers that were trying to take her out. So really it was going to have like evil energy in it. And you know, oftentimes you see these, you know, leaders of these cults that always say, you know, what do I have to gain from this? I'm just 
out here teaching, trying to wake people up. You know, I'm doing God's work. And then meanwhile, you know, if they're living on a compound or something, they're taking every member of their cult's checks that they make, putting it towards the, their community. Or in this situation, you know, you've, you you got to buy this organ from me. And you can't just buy one. She, it wasn't just like a one-time purchase. She said she made it very clear that you needed several of them. You needed one in every room of the house. You even needed them like outside throughout your property line to like prevent anybody from coming through. And then I mean, don't forget anybody that you love or care about. You've got to get some for them. You've got to get them to surround their property as well. Like just insane. And it's a freaking sham. Like that's, that's how she made her money. Her main belief was that evildoers, specifically like famous people, were aliens or reptilians that were walking around among us in skin suits to appear human. So again, purchasing this organ from her, it protects you from anybody in your life walking among you in this skin suit. When you're done watching, just Google her. I'm telling you right now, when you go to her website, it's it's overwhelming. I've known about this collaboration and I've been putting stuff together since December. And it's taken me a while to read through it because there's seriously moments where you just like get so caught in where when you're first reading it, you're just like, geez, Louise. And then you're like, well, I mean, I guess it could make sense the way she delivers it. And you're like, wait, do it does make sense? It does? And then I pull back and I come back to reality. So I mean, that's why I'll never judge somebody who's gotten trapped in these situations because I can absolutely see how if all of the circumstances in somebody's life aligned to be attracted into something like this, you know, if they were going through hardship, if they had mental illness, they just felt alone and that they just didn't fit in with any type of group, your mind starts to work and go in overdrive. And when somebody's delivering a message the way that she had the ability to and really convince people and just had this natural trusting nature about her for whatever reason I mean you can make somebody believe anything I just think one thing that's so important to remember is that they all work the same every one of them is they're the chosen one they are the ones who have been chosen to spread the message and it's their message that is right so that's what you have to remember it's like okay well with all of these ones you can't all be the, the chosen one the one that God has said or whoever your leader is that's choosing you has picked because there's tons that claim it so like who do you believe like I said though a, a lot of people believed Sherry she started gaining a lot of traction attention across the board on all of her social media sites and one person who found her and was instantly just engulfed and enthralled by her was a young guy named Stephen Minio and he started following Sherry when he was only 17 years old. Stephen's mom Donna said that Stephen was such a sweet baby. She was so excited to have him as her child and she said she really lucked out with how happy he was all the time. She explained that getting pregnant in the first place was very difficult for her so when it finally happened that appreciation was just even stronger. Stronger. And then 18 months later, she was blessed with another baby, another boy, and instantly there was just like such a strong connection between the two. The brothers grew up very, very close. It seems like the bond between Stephen's mom himself and his brother were, was a very tight bond. But I guess his father was known to have a very short temper and the situation at home wasn't always the greatest. I think particularly for Stephen's mom. So when he was 16, she decides that the safest thing to do for her is to just up and leave her family. And when I say up and leave, like literally she just up and left didn't pack anything, there was no warning, she just left with the clothes she was wearing. Since she did this and she left the boys, she said that the her ex-husband turned them against her. So the boys at this point were really, really angry with her. I mean, who, who could blame them? I absolutely understand that there are so many situations where that is the right thing to do for somebody who's in an abusive relationship and they just need to get away but I know that it takes a really long time for children to understand I mean even in your teens that this was the right decision and that's what Stephen was going through at this point he hadn't gotten there yet he hadn't seen it 
from his mother's side, he was just missing her and feeling abandoned. So the only way that she was able to communicate with him was by setting up this fake profile on Facebook and befriending him without him knowing that it was her. She said this was the best way for her to still stay close to him. There were often times that she would be able to see if he was maybe going through something rough and needed some advice and she would extend it to him and even though he didn't know it was coming from his mother, it just gave her comfort knowing that she was, you know, doing her best to try to guide him even if it was like on the sidelines and like under this ruse. So this is how she's keeping an eye on him for several years and she sees that his posts start to get darker and he's really focusing particularly on the end of times and then it starts to shift into hardcore religion mixed with reptilians and aliens and she's confused as an outsider looking into this because it's so religious but then mixed in with things that don't really make sense for like what she knows as like a religion. Behind the scenes Stephen wasn't just a follower of Sherry's. He wasn't just spreading this message for her because he admired her. They had built a really really close relationship and a close like a close working relationship as well. I think it was both personal and working. He helped her with her business. He was active on all of the platforms. He was spreading message to other forums to try to attract new people to her groups. He was also sending her money so that she could keep doing what she was doing and like sustain herself financially. So to me, he's he's consumed even more than her average follower because not only does he believe what she's saying, but like sh she's portrayed herself as this prophet and this messenger of Yahweh. Like she's the one who hearing and getting the directions and the next step and he's close to her therefore like he's also privy to this information and she trusts him and he's like on the front lines and he's involved in all of this so his connection with her was far closer than any of her other followers pretty much I think everybody within this following cult they knew it too like they Stephen was a very prominent presence, especially on Facebook. And it's through the Sherry Shriner Facebook page that Stephen Mignot meets a woman named Barbara Rogers. She was a fellow follower of Sherry's and they struck up a friendship quite fast. Barbara's upbringing was quite different than Stephen. She grew up in a military family and she herself also served for seven years. She said she left the military after she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. And she says after this diagnosis, what she does is she just spends all of her time at home and online and completely retreats in attempt to hide what she was dealing with from people that she knew around her. Understandably, I mean, if you have nothing to do all day and all you're doing is staying at home and you're just surfing the web, you are bound to come across conspiracy theories. And in 2011, that's exactly what happens. She gets caught up in this conspiracy theory rabbit hole online. And that's how she becomes aware of Sherry Schreiner. She says that as soon as she came across Sherry's page, she was instantly fascinated. And there was just something about her that was unexplainable. She just had this instant trust in anything that Sherry said. One thing that she thought was really cool that Sherry did was kill aliens. So she thinks this woman, she's badass. She's out there, Mars attacking it. And out of all of the conspiracy theories, she comes across conspiracy theorists. She comes across, she sticks with Sherry. So she's following all of her socials, specifically Facebook where she meets Steven. And initially their communication was just friendship based. They would just talk daily about, you know, Sherry's newest episode on her podcast. They'd exchange their theories of things that they would see online and how it, you know, ties into Sherry's breadcrumbs that she's dropping for you to like figure out and sort on your own. But eventually the communication, it gets flirty and then it quickly turns into a relationship. It seems like they fall in love very hard and very fast. And Barbara is Steven's first girlfriend. So he's got this, you know, not only this euphoria of a new relationship, but this is like his first love. 
And one day they're talking and he says to Barbara, he's always wanted to move to Mount Pocono. So one day they just literally decide on the fly to up and move in together. Not only just living together for the first time, but now they're, they've moved to another area and they're living in Mount Poconos. The relationship didn't appear unhealthy in terms of abuse or anything like that, but it definitely was unhealthy in terms of their obsession with this cult. They didn't have jobs, so both of them would just lock themselves in their studio. I think it was like a home, but it was just this one room. Like it's just essentially like a, a shack. And they're just stuck in this little box on their computers researching tons of material that is in connection with Sherry's beliefs, watching and reading everything that she posts. It turned them so fearful of the outside world. So they were just isolated inside this room essentially. And because Sherry said, you know, like the end of days are coming, don't trust anybody. They decided the best thing to do was just to like keep themselves holed up. And they don't even want to risk making other relationships or connections because she's got this fear instilled in everybody so strong that if you don't only follow her and if you're not just like completely committed, you're going to hell. So if you don't want that to happen, like if you want to go to heaven, the simple answer is to just believe and follow her. And I imagine for Steven in particular, and I guess Barbara too, because now she's connected to him, he feels that even stronger. And there's even more of a responsibility for him to just, you know, be loyal, be on guard anytime something new comes up so that he can read it. Cause he's essentially got this like tight bond with her. He's got like a VIP ticket to the pearly gates, man. Even though Steven is in this new relationship with Barbara. It really hasn't changed his loyalty to Sherry or his presence on social media. He's still as active as he was before. But for Sherry, when she comes, you know, across this knowledge that he's shacking up with Barbara, she's not down with it. You know, I've mentioned how much Steven is loyal to Sherry. But the relationship, like it wasn't just one-sided. I mean, she was very invested in Steven as well. She knew she had somebody like ride or die through and through in him. And she even described him as like a son to her. So with Barbara being the new broad in town, she's feeling threatened. And then Barbara makes a post on Facebook in April 2017. And this turns everybody's world upside down. She makes this post and it's a photo of raw meat with like a raw egg on top of it. And she writes in the post that she craves raw meat and she knows that for other people it can be disgusting, but for her it's a delicacy and it's something that she really enjoys. Once Sherry sees this post, she goes on a smear campaign against Barbara. She says she's now realized that Barbara is a reptilian in disguise in her skin suit. One of the clear telltale signs of a reptilian or someone evil is that they like raw meat and they crave the blood of the innocents. And this post right here shows that they've had evil in disguise among them. Everybody in this following instantly turns on Barbara and Steven's, you know, like stuck in the middle here. So he actually reaches out to a member of a different group. They followed more the biblical path, not like mixed in with like all the aliens and reptiles and skin suits and stuff. And he just admits to her like, I'm an absolute mess. Sherry's out there saying that my wife is a reptilian. Barbara and Stephen weren't married, but on social media and when they spoke to other people, they always refer to themselves as husband and wife. So that's how he's referring to Barbara. And this woman replies back to him and she says, there's a lot of red flags in, in terms of her. She's come to my attention a few times from people sharing her message and kind of questioning, you know, what's going on here because she claims to be somebody who follows the Bible, but then you've got this like sprinkle of all of these other things that don't mix. And so she basically tells Stephen, you know, when you really step back and, and start to listen to her message, you've got to know that it really doesn't jive with, with our biblical teachings. 
So he is understandably so lost. This is everything that he has poured himself into. He fully, fully believes it. And he goes through these motions of, of being quite torn. He's like, is Sherry telling the truth? Like, is Barbara a reptilian? Have I been sleeping with the devil? Maybe I'm being targeted because of my close relationship with Sherry. You know, she, how can Sherry be wrong? And then he goes back and forth to like, okay, but if I choose Barbara, I'm drawing this line in the sand, not only with Sherry and this family that I've met online, but also with God, because she has really hammered in the idea that if you don't trust and follow her, you're not going to heaven. Ultimately, he sticks by his lady. He believes Barbara when she says, I'm not a reptile. And this starts to give them clarity because they're now stepping back and realizing, okay, if she can make a lie about somebody being a reptile that clearly isn't, who else isn't a reptile? Again, when you sit back and just realize that this is a real person's life and these were their real beliefs and something that they poured themselves into for 13 years, I can't imagine how lost you would feel. You'd probably feel a lot of grief too. I don't even think it would be at the point of feeling, you know, so silly for, for believing something like that. You'd feel really betrayed. So what Stephen does is he attempts to reach out to some of these people that he was really close with and cared a lot about in the group. And he wants to explain to them, you know, just be careful. If she can do this to us, if she can just at the snap of her fingers decide that Barbara's a reptile, who else is she deciding on the fly is dangerous? Unfortunately, this move does not work out in Steven's favor, although he's trying his best just to protect people that he loves. It does the complete opposite and it turns everybody even further against him and Barbara to the point where they were threatening their lives, they were stalking them, they would like send them photos on Google Maps of their house and say like, we know where you live. We can't wait to get to you and take your blood and feed it to our queen, Sherry. Like it was really, really fucked up situation. So Steven starts to spiral. He's lost the woman that he considered not only like a mom, but a prophet of the God that they believed in. And now this group that he has looked at as family for the past 13 years have not only turned against him, but like they want him dead. He went to a really, really dark place. He starts questioning everything in his life. He feels duped because he was one of the main ones that helped spread this message, helped build her following, sent her money. According to Barbara, this it got to the point where it was just too much for Stephen. And on July 15th, 2017, a call goes out to 911 and it's from Barbara. On the with the operator she tells them that Stephen had his hands on the gun and it was placed on his forehead and that he kept yelling at Barbara to be the one to pull the trigger and in amongst the chaos she accidentally did. When police arrive they find Stephen and as they're asking Barbara what happened she tells them that Stephen was sitting down. Again he had his hands on the gun. He was begging her to pulled the trigger and that something must have happened and it accidentally went off. Just by first glance, the police are seeing that, okay, somebody definitely had it pressed up close to his forehead because there was an obvious contact wound. So it could match her explanation of, of him being the one to hold it there on his own. And he's also in this laid down position with his legs still crossed. They're not like crossed in like like let's sit down children in kindergarten and cross your legs. It's almost like he was sitting with them like extended crossed because they were still like that and then he was laying down. So this does match her version of him just sitting there with his legs crossed communicating with her. To me the position is it's too relaxed for somebody who wasn't expecting this especially with how close that wound was. There was no sign of him trying to like quickly get up and escape like his legs are still crossed. For investigators, it's deeper than that though. Obviously you need to look at everything as a whole and they didn't like the position of the gun. It didn't match with him being the one holding it. So they bring Barbara in for questioning. When she first gets there, they swab her fingers for gunpowder residue, gunshot residue, and it comes back that she's holding the gun. I need my uh, forensic family members to comment on this. I'm just curious to know, like ultimately at the end of the story, it's really 
not going to matter, but just for curiosity's sake, would gunshot residue go on your hands or fingers if you were only pulling the trigger and not like the one holding the gun. In my opinion, like my thoughts, if she's already told the 911 operator that she had been the one who accidentally pulled the trigger, it would make sense. Cause I think, you know, like the residue, like it disperses to like a certain amount. So if you actually have contact with the gun, I feel like it would be there anyways, even if he was holding it. I wanna know, I wanna know, I'm curious. So when they sit down to tell her that, okay, like you're, you got, you got the residue everywhere, girl. She starts to flip flop between a bunch of different scenarios, but they're all kind of like close to each other. Like they're, they're not like completely outstretched. There's just certain details that are exchanged here. So first she says he placed her hands on the gun when initially she said he had them on there. Then she said she didn't want to pull the trigger. The gun had gone off accidentally. And then she says she did pull the trigger because he was begging and screaming for her to do it and there was so much chaos and she didn't wanna do it, but, but she did it because he was asking her to. During some of those versions, his placement of his body didn't add up at all though because at one point she puts herself further away holding the gun, which doesn't make any sense just by the position of the body. When you look at it on arrival, like he, he had a clear contact wound, so they knew this was really close. So they just cut her off and they're like, listen, we've heard like seven different versions of this story in a matter of an afternoon, work with me here. Like we know it didn't go this way, doesn't match up with this way, just stop, stop Barbara, refresh and tell us what happened. So this is where she tells them that Stephen had been really depressed, he was in a really dark place and it was all because of a woman named Sherry Schreiner. And then she gives them the lowdown on Sherry running this, religious cult, how she and Stephen had been very close to each other and that recently everybody had turned on him. Her full account of the evening and everything leading up into that moment was that Stephen had gotten into another argument on Facebook that afternoon and he was really rattled. Again, just coming to the realization that all of these people that he loved had probably even recruited most of them, had turned on him. And it, it was getting to the point, you know, like when you go through, I can, what are the seven stages of grief? I don't remember all of them off by heart, but I know that when, the one is like when you are getting to like acceptance, but you're angry. So it sounds like that's where he was at. He was really mad. And Barbara said, you know what? We just need to step away from this. You need to get off the computer for the day. She says, they powered down and they decided to get out of the house for once and there was a local pub that was just down the street for them so they went there and they stayed there together talking until they shut the place down but even with all of that time together getting out trying to refresh he's still rattled he's still angry she says they're not even home for long and he goes and he grabs his gun and he grabs her hands and he wraps them around the gun and he takes her hands and he's the one who places it on his forehead and he's telling her she has to be the one to do it because if he does it he's not going to go to heaven so it has to be her. She explains that they went back and forth and it was just, it was escalating and she was panicked and he was panicked and angry at the end of his rope. He was, he was done. She says in that moment, she doesn't even remember how it happened. The gun goes off. She knows it's her who did it, but when she comes to and everything starts to settle in amongst the chaos, because now you're in complete silence. She doesn't even know how to properly process it because she's in denial that like this just happened. And she's looking at him almost waiting for him to get up. And then it hits her that like he's never going to. So after she shares this with the police, she's charged with murder that day. After their interview, Police want to talk to Sherry Schreiner. They want to understand what her version is of all the events and everything leading up because her name keeps coming up and seems to be the center of everything that went down. Getting in contact with her wasn't as easy as you'd figure it would be for somebody who was so present online and has such a big following. There's only like, I think two photos of Sherry Schreiner that you can easily find on the internet. She herself was almost like an enigma. 
which is so bizarre when you think about like and you really dissect like how loyal her following was because they're just following a voice or readings a blog that she wrote. The police eventually do end up being able to contact her. It's just through email though and she does respond back to them and they bring up what happened to Steven. She says she's aware of what went down with Barbara murdering him, you know, not taking any responsibility for what could have like led up to his mental state. In her response, she agrees to do an interview with them and share her side of the story. But then when they reply back and they're trying to coordinate how they're gonna get that all set up, she just ghosts them and they never hear from her again. She does share her thoughts though on her podcast with her followers. And one quote from her about Barbara was, I warned him about her being evil and to stay away and that eventually she was gonna kill him. And she did. So who's the crazy one? I mean, I mean, it's not a lie. She did kill him. But when you know like the backstory and how that all unfolded, it's easier for you to understand the events that led up to it and that this wasn't like a prophecy of Sherry's, but for her followers, like this just further reaffirms that everything she says is true. I'm really looking forward to listening to The Opportunist because the trailer for it has clips of some of these podcasts of Sherry talking. So it'll be really nice to have it all in just like one place to follow how it all unfolded there. Cause like I said, when you go to her website and you go on these social media pages that she has, it's, it's chaotic. The police never did get a chance to ever interview Sherry or talk to her again. Less than a year after Stephen Minio was killed, Sherry Schreiner dies from what her family says was natural causes. And in June 2019, Barbara was convicted of third degree murder and she was sentenced to 15 to 40 years in jail. My, my final thoughts on the whole thing are, I feel like groups and cults like this that are created online are, they're quite scary. You essentially have access to anybody in the world who has an internet connection. And when, you know, like when that match strikes and you get momentum, like it's dangerous. I've seen it really recently with, I, I'm not even gonna say the full name because I know it's gonna probably like flag my account. And on the chance that we can get some ads on here, I don't wanna mess it up by saying this name, but I'm gonna say it as Q, blank and I personally know people who follow this and they've become so engulfed in dissecting these breadcrumbs that this unknown person is dropping for them online and they're losing absolutely everything but like I said at the beginning they feel like they've never seen clearer so it's like all of us who are, you know, still under this veil and it just breaks my heart. I've looked into this following quite a bit. I've watched the video that they like to use to rope people in. And initially, you know what? At the beginning, there are things in there that are factual. You can look into it. You can back up the accusation that certain individuals do have certain criminal records have done questionable things that are very well known in the public eye but then it's like almost like once you get like wrapped in and you're like oh yeah that, that that's actually true the rest of it it's almost like for shock factor and they'll throw out and look at this like look at who so and so knows and did and said and in this interview this looks like a clone that's not them what happened to the real one it turns into theories you know like which is why it's a conspiracy theory it's speculation based on oh well so and so knows this person who knows this person who did this who did this so it's all got to be connected and while yes sometimes that can be true it isn't all the time for every single thing and these claims they just get so out of control outlandish I can't even tell you how many times I've seen certain people that I personally know send out these you know warning messages that on such and such a day on such and such a time the world is going to go into a blackout and during this time the streets are going to be cleared of all of the evil wrongdoers and you know every single time that moment comes and it passes and we haven't gone into a blackout and nothing has happened but then they'll always have a reason as to why an excuse as to how 
you know, the prediction could have been wrong and it, it might actually be on this day, which again then comes and goes when nothing happens, but it never changes their rock solid loyalty and belief in these things. They'll defend it to their dying day. And they all use the same verbiage as Sherry Schreiner did, you know, the end is coming, get right with God, the storm is coming. Like she's used all of this before and so have many cult leaders before her. I mean, look at Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. By the way, we will have an update for that one. I know a lot of you guys wanna see it. I'm just waiting for more to progress like within the trial and stuff, everything for their court has been delayed because of the C virus. But they are a prime example of end of day believers, you know, getting everybody to get right with God and prepare for the end. And what ultimately happened is two innocent children, two spouses that we know of, have all lost their lives because these two believed that they were taken over by zombies. And they needed to do their part to, you know, clear the road of everything against their God and make room for the very limited number of people that could go to heaven with them because they were the ones chosen to like pick who could do that. Me personally, I'm not against conspiracy theories. There are a few that I actually believe and that I'm intrigued by, but you have to also have the ability to like openly research and learn to distinguish between what's actually fact and what somebody's taking and trying to spin and turning into a theory. If you just go in reading a biased article or following someone's word that you trust and you've never even met or seen, the amount of damage that it does to not only you but other people's lives, it's just, it's friggin scary man. Like these situations scare the shit out of me, which is why I wanted to be a part of this because I do think it's so important right now. The whole situation is so sad in this case when you step back and you realize you know that it's not just wow that's batshit crazy believing that someone's wearing a skin suit like it's real life they really did believe that Stephen was a real guy who poured everything into this woman online that he had never met before and then lost everything my opinion on how his death happened when I see the photos I believe Barbara's final account of it of him sitting down placing her hands on the gun and begging her to do it. She's clearly somebody who can easily be influenced by other people, especially if it's somebody who she loves so, so much. Then in amongst this chaos and like this traumatic situation, I can see how, how it could happen. I feel really sad for Stephen's birth mother as well, who never had the chance to repair that relationship or let her son know that she was the one behind the scenes, keeping an eye on him, trying to give him advice here and there when she could. She actually found out about Stephen's passing on the news with everybody else. I obviously feel so horrible for Stephen who, I can't imagine experiencing that betrayal from somebody who you now looked at as a mother. And then there's also the sense that I feel for Barbara. I hope that doesn't sound insensitive of me by any means. I don't agree with what she did, but I believe that there was no malicious intent behind that. I do feel like the version that she eventually tells the detectives that first day is what happened. Even though Sherry's gone, her teachings are not have not stopped her daughter is now running her page for her and it seems to still be attracting followers which is terrifying especially considering the fact that Sherry's not here to be the one like delivering these prophecies and she preached so much that she was the chosen one to do that so again it just goes to show you how things can change and switch up and be aware of like red flags she never mentioned anything before about her daughter also having this gift and being chosen at a young age to be this prophet and save the world. It's these things that you just have to sit back and think like, okay, like does this, does this really make sense? It doesn't. Again, I cannot wait for the opportunists to come out in my gift package. They also sent me um, a little description of the podcast and what's to come. So I'm gonna share that with you guys. And they also sent me a trailer 
So I'm also gonna roll that bad boy when I'm done. From Cast Media, The Opportunist is a new podcast that tells true stories of regular people who turn sinister simply by being opportunistic. In our first series, we investigate the murder of Stephen Minio. He was shot by his girlfriend, Barbara Rogers, who had seemingly no motive to kill him. As we look into the details of the murder, the story becomes dark and convoluted and points to the couple's involvement with the doomsday internet cult led by a woman named Sherry Schreiner. The series follows Sherry, a Midwestern mom, as she gains thousands of followers online by promoting her own religion, which is a blend of biblical doomsday predictions and Q adjacent conspiracy theories, and profits on selling Oregon, a spiritual weapon to defeat aliens and demons. As she rises to the status of infallible goddess, she leaves a trial of death and destruction in her wake. Here's the trailer for you guys to check out. Now on, where's your emergency? My boyfriend, he had a gun, and he told me, you press this trigger. Oh my god, he's dead. This is a nightmare, please. This okay, is a nightmare. calm down. What is your name? My name is Barbara Rogers. Woman who claims her boyfriend wanted her to kill him because of problems with an online cult pleaded not guilty today in the Poconos. Sherry Schreiner was an ordinary woman who believed the world was ending and that she had the key to salvation. She created an army of warriors to fight beside her in the spiritual battle between God and Satan, which ultimately resulted in murder, suicide, and mind control. How does a poor woman in a cow town with practically nothing inspire mankind to stand up against the strongholds of Satan to the point where he is burning out of the skies. What would it take for a regular person, someone like you or me, to turn into a maniacal cult leader with no regard for human life? We did it, folks. We did it. <laughs> From Cast Media, this is The Opportunist. A podcast about regular people who turn sinister simply by embracing opportunity. Ah, it sounds so good. Okay, that is it for me today, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so, so much. I will not see you guys next week, so you know I'm gonna be super terribly missing you until the next time. I'll see you the first week of March. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.